sister Chris and husband Denny, brother Bill and wife Diane, and we're going to miss brother Brian because he's recuperating from some back surgery. Also joining us are lots of cousins, nieces, nephews, grandnieces, and nephews. You are all treasured by John and Debbie, and can you all please just stand or wave or something so that everyone knows who you are. <laughs> so we want to first of all say thank you for joining us to celebrate John. Whether you travel from Ohio, Arizona, California, Colorado, Washington, or across our state, or the Portland community, we thank you as we gather to honor a life filled with home runs. Whether you knew John as a husband, father, grandfather, brother, brother-in-law, uncle, or great uncle, or as a baseball coach, a golf partner, a touch mark Parkinson's classmate, a basketball referee, a neighbor, a Jansen associate, or a volunteer at St. Vincent de Paul of Ascension Parish. John treasured most of you. <laughs> Before we hear John's stories by friends and families, we have a few important thank yous. To, Brent, to excuse me, Brenda and Kent Moore for the Yummy Munchies uh, yogurt. And cheese yoga. <laughs> to Lauren and Artemis catering for our delicious lunch. Wasn't that great? <laughs> to Jose Solis for sharing his talents and creating our beautiful banner back here. <laughs> to Adrian and Diane Lake, our balloon ladies, extraordinary, <laughs> and to our early morning setup group. <laughs> To Pauline, Letty, Julie, Jeannie, and the hospice team who all made it their mission to keep John at home and support Debbie in caring for him. Ready? during this very tough time. We know that John was never at a loss for words. So let's share some memories and some John stories. I remember John as a brother-in-law, a great friend to our children and our grandchildren, and a hole-in-one maker. He left a mark on all those he met. I will remember John for his wit and humor, opinions on all things sports, and the many friends he made over his 80 years. He was an avid beaver through and through, but gradually became also a PSU Viking fan. He was a computer guru when they were the size of a house. We didn't have enough family trips, Sunday dinners, or golf games. John will be terribly missed by Debbie, his family, and ours. So could, could we now have Tom Watt come up and say a word or two? Parties and good times, and like uh, Tom had said, he's always always had his 
years ago when I started officiating basketball, which is, as you all know, John was an exceptional basketball official. He officiated many state tournaments and was well respected and even liked by a few coaches. So we became good friends uh, as he asked me to help him do the treasurer duties at uh, the Basketball Association. And he, at that point, showed me his meticulous side as he worked through negotiating the system and trying to make the system better. And this was before computers and the way it's certainly done now, but it was all done by hand. He printed out registration sheets and then he had to fill the checks and then you, you know. So I called, I talked to him one day, I go, well, what are you doing? Well, I'm still, I still got this stuff all over the floor. I said, what do you mean you got all over the floor? Well, I got the, he's got the registration form, he's got the check and he's got to make sure it all balances. Well, he made sure it all balanced and he did an excellent job because everybody enjoyed it when they got their check on time because John made sure that everybody got paid correctly and on time. His organizational skills also were present with the PBOA golf tournament. He did a good job with that. And I was just talking to one of the officials back here and that was another thing that he kind of brought together a little bit new. He would he put all the names into a, a uh, program and they were going to make the foursome go by handicap and everything. And as Randy and I were talking, I think he fudged here or there and made sure that he got the guys to play with him on, on, on those, those, those tournaments. But uh, he did such a good job. The tournament was named after him. saying this, but he was really a better art organizer than Walter. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's art. It was always fun, always good time, always fun to have a, a round of golf. He was a good friend, and uh, if I ever needed anything, he was there. I'd say, you know, just give him a call, and it, it was all, it was going to be taken care of. My wife Kathy and I have spent, uh, Numerous good times with he and Debbie, uh, adventures, dinners out, whatever, and with Kathy and I are hopeful that we'll still be able to continue those times with them. Uh, one thing that you probably, you probably all know this, but maybe not, but uh, surprised the heck out of me, uh, John became quite the painter in his retirement. John, people will come, Uncle John. Of the memorabilia you will share with us 
and the stories of our past of our past time that will inevitably follow. Then, and then we will walk up to the bleachers and sit in our short sleeves on a perfect afternoon. And we will find that we have reserve seats somewhere along the baselines where we sat when we were children and cheer our heroes. We will watch the game and it'll be as if we dipped ourselves into magic waters. The memories will be so thick we'll have to brush them away from our faces. We will remember Uncle John how you coached your team with fire, fury, and vigor. We will remember how you would get very excited to talk with the umpires who somehow all had the same name, Blue. <laughs> Yes, Dad, we will come from near and far and remember the great games at Rose City and Madison and Grant and Lentz Park and Scavone Field. We will remember the double running suicide squeeze, the drag fund and the championships, championships of the league, of the city, of the state, even a World Series appearance. People will come, Grandpa John. More than anything, we'll remember just like with each of us, the relationship you have with your players, players that you taught and inspired, the players who revered, respected, and appreciated you, both of those are memories that will live forever. Many of these players would say you were the best coach they ever had, and that they will never forget. The one constant through all these years, Uncle John, has been baseball. America has rolled by like an army of steamrollers. It's been erased like a blackboard, rebuilt and erased again but baseball has marked the time. This field, this game, is part of our family's past, Uncle John. It reminds us of all that once was good and that could be good again. Oh, people will come to Selwood Park, Uncle John. People will most definitely come. For those who don't know me, my name is Xander Lake. I am the grandson of Grandpa John, and today we are gathered here today to celebrate the life of a loved one. We are here to celebrate and remember John Albert Lake, the father, character, jokester, coach, grandpa, and human he was. 
Grandpa John raised three boys, Denny, Jimmy, and Kenny, and he married Barbara Bruns and later ended up marrying Deborah Lake for about 40 years. He was a great dad to his three boys by teaching them self-discipline and self-competence. He was a great character and he always tried to give jokes. Sometimes people took them as him giving them a hard time, but he ultimately meant it to be funny. He coached baseball and youth basketball for years. He has been the grandfather of many grandchildren, including myself. When I was first born, I was actually in the ICU for 10 days at Hope Hospital, and Grandpa wanted to make sure I was okay. He constantly messaged my dad to make sure I was okay, and would always play with me when I was young, give me lots of love and joy from his vibe. He was very supportive and always supported us of what we did. Once back in 2012, we were on a dumpy boat in Balboa, and I asked my dad if I could drive the boat. He said I could try it. I went on the steering wheel and tried driving the boat, and Grandpa John got really dizzy. <laughs> in 2013, Grandpa John came down, and we went to VOC Fair together. We went on lots of rides and saw the Eagles tribute band, also California. He also came in 2014, helped us move to the new house and spend his senior year with his grandkids. He always thought about the success for his grandchildren and was very supportive of his families, the family band that me and my family were doing for a while, the Lake Family Singers. He was a great human. He always wanted what's right, not what's wrong. Even though we are here to say our last goodbye to Grandpa John, he did everything he could to get himself back in shape and back in good health. He took many Parkinson's classes in many ways to help him. Unfortunately, God knows when it's time to let his people go, and God had a plan for Grandpa John to pass in peace, love, and harmony. Thank you very much. Rest in peace, John Albert Lake. <laughs>
best thing ever. <laughs> you know, because we had a black and white. I know the kids nowadays are like, huh, what? Um, we bought our house in Wasco a few years later, and you know, you started with the computers and the data processing, and like you know, some of the other people explained, he was way ahead of his time on the computers. Um, when we started playing baseball, he got very involved in Rose City Little League, and then Madison Babe Ruth. Um, as I grew older, I realized that my dad was not your average baseball coach. He was passionate and animated, and his mind worked a mile a minute. You know, some of his mantras, get down into position, focus on defense. If the other team can't score, they can't win. He had interesting plays, the double running suicide squeeze, the delayed steal, and he coached an aggressive style of baseball. He wasn't just a good baseball coach, those of you that were around him know. He was great. He won a state championship at Rose City Little League. They went to the Western Regionals. They lost in the first game to Arizona in extra innings. Back then it was single elimination. Arizona made it to the World Series and lost to Taiwan that year. That's how close he was to like getting to the, you know, uh, Williamsport to be in the Little League World Series. Um, he won a state championship at Madison with Madison Babe Ruth. Ken was on the team and they also came very close. They made it to the Western Regionals of Miles City and lost in the finale. You know, they were a double elimination tournament. Um, he touched many players and he was a huge positive influence on their lives. A lot of people have told me to this day, he was the best coach I ever had. Um, he was a great influence on me. So I heard my uncle Bill talking a little bit earlier about Grant and Madison and some of the rivalries. So when dad was coaching Madison Babe Ruth, they were playing Grant in like a state semifinal game and one of his rivals from high school, Tom Tracy, was on the other side coaching Grant. So this wasn't just Madison Grant, this was Tom Tracy versus John Lake. And they took it, <laughs> they took it personal. They were like yelling at each other, yelling at the umpire, yelling, I almost thought they were gonna get into it. Dad got ejected. He got ejected from the game. They forced him to leave the stadium. It was a Walker Field, but he ended up, he didn't leave, he snuck around to one of the gates and there was no one guarding him. He started yelling instructions through the gate. <laughs> Madison won the game. The front page of the Oregonian sports section the next day was a picture of dad outside the stadium yelling through the gate because he wanted to beat his rival, Tom Tracy, and he did. <laughs> um, so, as you know, we talked about how my dad was a crazy, you know, good basketball official. I remember when he made it to his first state tournament how excited he was, how meaningful that was to him. I know he made it there many times. Um, and he had an impact on the fans too, not just the coaches and players. He used to have a full head of hair, you might remember. And he had a mustache, he was a very handsome man. And unfortunately due to a medical condition, he lost his hair, but he continued refereeing. And some fans at a game one time wanted to taunt him and they threw combs at him when he was refereeing because now he was bald just to make, but you might think they're taunting him, but actually to me, that's honoring him. He had such an influence. When does a referee have such influence on a game that you go there because you want to taunt the referee, not the other team. So that shows you, you know, how much um, he was able to make an influence on basketball. Um, as I said, dad loved computers, and I don't know how many of you knew this, but he had a revolutionary football scouting system. He started it in the 70s. He called it Lakes Flexi Data Scouting System. He'd have an assistant coach chart the opponent's plays, what they ran and when, what holes they would use on what down, what patterns they had, and dad had a program in the 70s that would review the data and would help people understand the tendencies for the next game. This is now called analytics. Every single pro team uses analytics. My dad figured this out, John Albert Lake in the 70s, that this was the future. He had a lot of major high school programs and even small college programs that were using that system back then. I moved in with my dad when I was a junior in high school, after they were divorced. He had a bachelor pad, I was getting a little out of control. So I moved in with him and uh, he welcomed me in and he pretty much gave me unlimited freedom. I went from completely <laughs> being under control to do whatever you want. Um, and he went on a trip to Hawaii and was gonna be gone for about a week and I was told you cannot go in the apartment while I'm gone on the lake. 
Okay? So <laughs> I left a window ajar, and uh, he left and was gone in Hawaii. I came, I opened the window, and I had a big beer bash party for all the high school kids. We had a two bedroom apartment. There was probably 100 people in there. There was beer cans everywhere. There was trash everywhere. The walls were dirty and everything. Uh, it was fun, but then the apartment managers came and kicked us out and said, you're not supposed to be here. And so they wouldn't allow me to stay and clean it. But I was smart. I left the window open again so I could come back the next day. So I came back the next day to clean it, climbed in, we're cleaning and vacuuming. We're maybe a quarter done when all of a sudden the apartment manager catches me. It's like, no, you're not supposed to be in here. So they kicked me out again, they locked every window. Oh, no. So here I am, my dad's gonna be in Hawaii for three more days and I'm tortured because I know the mess he's gonna find when he walks in. He's gonna see beer cans, he's gonna see stuff on the walls, he's gonna see people going through all the stuff in our house and I was so worried about how much trouble I was gonna get in. But um, when he got back, instead of going crazy and grounding me for a month or making me move back in with my mom or making me clean the bathroom with a, with a toothbrush, he just talked to me about respect. Probably a 15 or 20 minute talk about respect and respecting other people and um, his things, his place. He was not loud, he was not angry. It was just a moving and convincing speech. And instead of him making me feel bad, I felt bad myself because it was so, so much wisdom, you know, um, in what he said to me and just taught me like, you know, how could I do this to my dad? Even though I might be a crazy teenager who wants to have a beer party when my dad's out of town, he just made me feel, you know, like you gotta think about other people. And that's some of the wisdom, you know, that my dad had. And, you know, it was one of the best lectures I ever had in my life. It was painful at the time, but I learned a lot of lessons from it. Um, I left to go to college to Denver, and during that period, my dad and I butted heads a lot. He was going through a little bit of a wild phase at that time, so was I. Um, and we had a falling out, and I ended up not coming home from college and staying with him probably for a year. We didn't talk for a year or two. When uh, Grandpa Mel, his father, Marvelous Mel, to those of you who know him, when he passed away, apparently he and dad were estranged at that time. And my dad called me and he just said, you know, I don't ever want to be that way with you ever again because I was that way with my grandpa and my, with my dad. And I just don't want to ever be that way again. You know, we just need to figure it out and, and bury the hatchet. So, you know, um, ever since then, things got a, a lot better. And then Debbie came into the picture and she made John's, my dad's life so much better. She was a great counter and a compliment to his, his personality and energy. Um, my dad always wanted me to be a sportscaster. I had been a sportscaster in high school and college and uh, that's what I wanted to do. But then I got involved in music and rock bands and he always, he didn't like that. He was against it. Um, always wanted me to go back to sports casting, but when I moved to California, you know, I was like, this is what I want to do, and uh, I wanted to make my own CD. I interned at a record company to learn how the record company worked and how to get on the radio, and so I was like, how can I get my dad to help invest in this? So I put together a business plan. <laughs> so I put together a business plan, and to Dad and Debbie and my mom's credit, they all gave me some money to help us put out our first CD. And I was so happy when my dad gave me his feedback that he was so proud of me. You know, um, the artwork, the music, everything, and that actually ended up helping me get my first record deal. Um, around that same time, dad and Debbie said, you know, we, what really matters most to us is family, and we wanna start traveling and seeing our family a lot. And you know, it was actually a conversation. This is what we wanna focus on. And I got to say, they were great grandparents, even though they lived in, you know, Oregon and we were in California and Jim was in Colorado. They were around all the time. They made frequent visits. They made the kids a big impact in all the kids' lives. We got my son, Xander and Zane, uh, Jim's son, Ryan. I know they were a huge influence, Grandpa John, in, uh, in Ryan's life. And then my brother, Ken's kids, Ben and Sydney. And uh, he was, and Debbie and him both were uh, very, very instrumental in their lives as grandparents. Um, in 2015, Dad and Debbie, they rented a house in Palm Springs for a month and they told me they planned to buy a place out there 
so we could come down more often and be in more involved with the family. And we were all so thrilled. We're going to get to see him all the time, you know. Um, but at that time, my dad was starting to show some of the effects of the Parkinson's. We didn't know what it was yet. And he and I went golfing. I had never, I know you said he wasn't that good, but no. he, compared to me, he was good. <laughs> and uh, I'd never beaten him in my life. But we played that day, and I could see him being wobbly on some holes, and I actually beat him, but, you know, I didn't know why. And then, you know, a month or two later, um, you know, we found out that he had, um, you know, the Parkinson's. Um, obviously, it's a pretty tough situation finding out about that. Um, but you never know that, talking to my dad. He was strong as a rock. He was positive and determined. He and Debbie committed to doing everything possible to combat and delay the onset of the disease, and he began, began taking exercise classes and became very involved in a group with other patients with a similar diagnosis. I know some of those people from the group are here. It was a very positive experience, um, and uh, he attacked it with the same energy he brought to baseball coaching and being a grandfather. And I think I wasn't around every day like you guys and Debbie, but it seemed like that helped him hold it off for several years and he could be productive. There was no shame, sadness, anger, or pity in my father about his diagnosis and about, you know, which ended up being terminal. He had dignity. My dad had dignity. He made the most of every moment. Due to the diagnosis, there were less visits, but I call it, I would call a great visit where he and I were talking politics. We'd never really seen eye to eye on this in the past, and I did not even think he respected my opinion much. But I told him all my ideas, and he's like, you should run for Congress. <laughs> Me? I thought I was, you know, this crazy liberal. But anyway. <laughs> and so it was so meaningful to hear that from him. On my last visit to see Dad, he was fading and he was laid up in bed. Debbie and I were standing on the other side of the bed and we were talking to him about his legacy as a coach, his grandson playing Pac-12 baseball, the impact and influence he had on his grandkids, all his former players and how much we all loved him. And he was kind of shaky. He reached out and he grabbed my hand from one side of the bed and then with his other arm trembling, he grabbed Debbie's hand and I mean, it wasn't easy for him. And then he put all our hands together. And it just showed how big his heart was. Because my dad acted tough. But underneath it all, he was a big softy. He was a great man who had a major impact on all who met him, knew him, and came in contact with him. And dad, we miss you. And we love you. We will never forget you. mistakes for today, so you're all excused. <laughs> Stick around uh, as long as you want, but uh, thank you very much for uh, coming and joining us. We have the park all day. So